Good afternoon. Welcome to Plant Invaders, a National Endowment for the Arts Big Read program this afternoon, coordinated by the Poughkeepsie Public Library District. My name is Jewel Ratzlaff, and I'm glad you could join us today. This program is being recorded and will be available on the Poughkeepsie Public uh, Library website in a few days, so you can enjoy it there. Those of you joining us on Zoom, would you please keep your microphones muted? And if you have questions, Brent will be happy to answer some questions at the end. Put those questions in the chat box area and uh, he'll be able to address it after the presentation. Um, without further ado, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, today we have the privilege of um, hosting Brent Boscarino, an invasive species citizen science program coordinator. Um, he's also with the, um, let's see, with the New Jersey, New York Trail Conference. He joined the Trail Conference in 2019 as invasive species citizen science coordinator. He spent the last 10 years as a high school science teacher and environmental outreach coordinator at Poughkeepsie Day School in Poughkeepsie and previously at the Harvey School in Katona, New York. Brent received his undergraduate degree from Middlebury College in 2001 and his PhD in natural resources from Cornell in 2009. He is a nature enthusiast to the core who strives to foster an authentic sense of wonder about the natural world. Brent is an avid runner and former soccer coach, enjoys hiking, fishing, swimming, and other forms of outdoor recreation with his wife, Jessica, and two sons, Wynn and Ryder. Welcome, Brent. Thanks, guys. I'm so excited to be a part of this and here with you. I wish I could be there in person, but, you know, circumstances uh, prevented that. But uh, I've got some good videos for you today, and it's going to be like being together on a nature walk just digitally. So um, I'm very excited to be here and, and to start this process with you guys. And, of course, um, you know, should you have any questions, certainly en en enter that in the chat box. So uh, here's a, just a little bit of an overview of today's agenda. We're going to start with just some invasive species ecology 101. What are invasive species? What um, role do they play in our ecosystems and our forest ecosystems in particular? And why the need to protect our native habitats and natural areas? We'll then get into how you guys can get involved because it's one thing to learn about it. But when we want to give back and do something, you know, how, how do we go about doing that as community scientists? So I'll show you guys a few helpful ID apps and then offer up some uh, community or citizen science opportunities for you to follow up on. And then we'll get into identifying some common invasive plants in the Mid-Hudson area um, and some of the best management practices. I'll give you some advice as to what to do once you learn how to ID some of these common invasive species. And as Drew, um, oh yeah, and uh, so I'll do that in a couple of different ways. We'll go over some IDs, some removal advice, and then I'll be showing you some field ID videos that I happen to take. So it'll sort of be like being together on a nature walk. Um, and you'll definitely get to see the variation in nature as well. And just as Juliet pointed out, if you are uh, signed on through Zoom, just remember to stay muted. And certainly if you have questions as it goes along, type them in the chat box and I'll take them at the end of the talk today. Um, just to go into a little bit more about my role at the trail conference, I mean, I am an educator for life. Like I love to try to inspire people to get outdoors. So a lot of people that I end up working with or, or come to our talks, um, you know, just have a desire to and love for nature, to move, to be outdoors. And what my role is, is try to combine that passion for wanting to get outside, to want to explore and learn and protect our natural areas and, and to give back. And that uh, can be done through community science. Um, at the trail conference, you know, I helped to coordinate a, a basically a volunteer powered citizen science program. Um, we are called the Invasive Strike Force, so it's a group of volunteers of multiple different ages to help track the distribution of invasive species in our region in northern New Jersey and throughout um, the lower Hudson Valley in New York. These are some of the interns that worked with me in the past, but we have, you know, a lot of like retired volunteers and, and 
um, you know, people of all ages that want to just give back and be outdoors and, and learn how to ID plants around us. Um, before we get going on the IDs, and uh, I just wanted to provide a little bit of context and take a step back. You've probably heard a lot of these terms, so let's just all get on the same page. So you may have heard the terms non-native or invasive species. So what's the difference between those? What do those actually mean? When I talk about a non-native species, it's one that was basically brought to this area, either whether it's the Northeast United States or New York State, um, usually by, by humans uh, transferring them to a region. I'm not talking about natural migration, but humans had um, a way of like, introducing them uh, through like, you know, transportation or something. So this could be cultivated or uncultivated, but it, it, humans had a role in bringing them to this region, a region which they didn't evolve in naturally for thousands, sometimes if not millions of years. But to be considered truly invasive, not only does it have to be non-native or not have evolved in these ecosystems where we live, but it also has to be harmful to the environment. And how we typically measure that in uh, ecological terms is, does it decrease the native uh, biodiversity? So the, the, the number of species that have evolved in this area, does it decrease their ability to survive and thrive? To be truly invasive, it needs to be harmful to native biodiversity. So I just wanted to provide some examples that you probably are familiar with. The dreaded stink bug, right? Um, so we, I have these all crawling all over my house. They're in between my sliding glass doors and, and are a nuisance, not only around our properties, but they can cause extensive damage to um, you know, agricultural crops. Um, they were introduced in around 1998 to Pennsylvania. And I just wanna say there's a number of different ways these invasive species can get here. Like with the stink bug, they were just what are called hitchhikers. So they were brought over on shipping crates from Eastern Asia as part of just like hanging on to crates um, and just got introduced when the crates were unpacked and now caused like just in 2010 alone in, in Pennsylvania, we're talking about $37 million uh, worth of crops, uh, crop damage to the apple crops in Pennsylvania. Um, and now, you know, they just feed, they have these little stylets or this little mouthpiece that they suck the juices out of fruits. So anything that's soft and juicy, these stink bugs will feed on and cause damage to those crops and ecological systems as well. So, so economic and ecological impacts of these. And this is how one way they can get here, just by accident, by hitchhiking on, on shipping and transportation. A lot of the species we're gonna be talking about today though, were actually introduced on purpose. You may recognize some of these, Japanese barberry we'll talk about today, multiflora rose, um, oriental bittersweet, that were planted on purpose. Usually it's for ornamental qualities, just because the flowers look really pretty or the berries are really pretty during a certain part of the season. You'll start to see a trend that a lot of the invasive species that have taken over native ecosystems are really beautiful in some way, right? Or they serve some sort of purpose as like hedgerows or some sort of barrier, say on, um, on fence lines or in transportation systems, like along highways or roadways or something. But then when they escape is when they start causing problems. So the question is, how do these invasive species spread, right? It's one thing to plant them on purpose on your property, but then how do they get out into other areas and start impacting our natural areas? Well, one way, of course, is that the berries are juicy. You know, the animals like to eat them. So think about birds, you know, coming to, just because you plant, uh, you know, something that's non-native in your property, you're like, oh, well, it's just on my property, right? I don't, I mean, what's the big deal? Well, birds um, and other mammals might come over, and mammals may come over, feed on those berries, and then deposit their seeds out in the middle of a remote area in a natural area that we're trying to protect and start impacting our forest ecosystems, right? We all learned in, you know, uh, early elementary school, you know, that uh, seeds get dispersed, you know, by sticking to fur of animals, by a wind dispersal, through water dispersal. And of course, like, you know, we walk through these areas too. So uh, dispersal through, um, you know, boots and our clothing and stuff. So we need to be careful about these sorts of things. So I, the one thing I wanna leave you with is just because you don't see a plant rapidly spreading in and around your property, doesn't mean that its seeds and its babies and its offspring aren't being transported by something to a more remote area or these parks and natural areas that we're trying to protect. So something to be mindful of 
the next time you go to a nursery and you're thinking, hmm, what do I want to put in my yard? Do I want to pet, uh, plant a native species or one that is invasive? And unfortunately, we're still selling a lot of invasive species in nurseries. So something to be mindful of. And this is essentially what happens when they escape. You might notice, we're going to talk about this later, but it's oriental bittersweet. Very popular along pergolas because, you know, in the dreary winter months, they have these wonderful berries that you can see. And they, they're they great at adhering to things, right? I mean, they wrap around things. That's what vines like to do. And so what ends up happening is when those berries get dispersed, you see this. I mean, you guys all know what I'm talking about. You drive down on the highway or roadways, these trees just smothered in vines. This is what happens when it's totally taken over by an invasive species. This is oriental bittersweet just all over this tree here. There's nothing that can grow under there. I mean, that's just the total monocultures totally smothering and killing these trees. As to how the invasive plants can cause environmental harm, well, certainly, you know, they take up space and resources that our native species need. So they're outcompeting our native, native plants uh, in some way, whether that's blocking them from sunlight or maybe just uptake of water and other nutrients that our native plants need to survive. Here's an example of something we'll talk about later, which is Japanese stillcrest. You probably have it on your own properties, but it's now infringing on our forest areas as well. This is a complete monoculture or just all Japanese stillcrest in the understory of this, where you should see lots of native species thriving in the understory of these forests. Here's an emerging invasive vine called kudzu. It's actually referred to as the vine that ate the south. And now we're saying that it's actually nibbling in the north because it's starting to invade our ecosystems here in um, New York State. And you can see just the smothering of vines. There's not much that can grow beneath that. So many people, when I talk and talk about this, they're like, well, they're invasive species. They're green. They're giving off oxygen. What's the big deal? I mean, they're here. What's the big deal, right? Well, it's a very direct link between native plants and supporting a more diverse wildlife. Most of our uh, species of native insects, for example, including a lot of the butterflies we like to see in our gardens, are adapted to eat native plants because they've evolved together for thousands, if not, you know, you know hundreds of thousands of years, right? The majority of our plant-eating insects in our areas are specialized to three or fewer species of plants. The best example I can give of that are our monarch butterflies. So you may know that they, they rely on native milkweeds for their life cycle. They migrate down to Mexico and then they make their way on this beautiful migration up into our regions and our areas here in the, in the Northeast, but they only feed on native milkweeds. So if you have a situation where invasive plants are taking over and outcompeting our native milkweeds, or, you know, this is a really interesting example, we have an emerging uh, plant called swallowwort, which mimics the chemicals and looks of native milkweed. And what ends up happening is that the monarch butterflies lay their eggs on this invasive swallowwort, thinking that their caterpillars can survive on that, but they can't eat the swallowwort. But the mothers think that it's, um, they think it's milkweed. And so it's just like an egg dump. So not only can you have invasive species out competing for space with our natives, you can even have some trickery involved with some of the uh, invasive species that are taking over. Um, and this has had really cascading effects on food webs. It's one thing that uh, the invasive plants are out competing our native plants, but with the loss of those natives, we've seen a huge decline in the number of insects in the environment declining globally. Over the last three decades, we've seen a precipitous drop over 75% in insect biodiversity. This is globally. So not only, you know, that's a big problem for insects and for plants, of course. But remember that those insects serve as food for many other animals, including birds, uh, small mammals that we're also trying to protect in our area. So this is a food web. This is a whole ecosystem effect that we're seeing here. The end result, essentially, is that you know, invasive species as an issue, as a topic, is the second biggest driver of species extinction globally. In the United States, it's considered the number one threat to native biodiversity is invasive species. And in the world, it's second only to habitat destruction, things like rainforest destruction or coral reef destruction. That's it. Invasive species are a huge issue, huge issue. So the question is, you know, what, why? Why does this matter if that our 
diversity is decreasing and that invasive species are playing a role in that. Well, biodiverse ecosystems, native habitats make more resilient ecosystems. So future environmental changes, things like climate change or just weather impacts like storms and things, you have a more resilient ecosystem able to bounce back from stresses if you if it's more diverse if there's more species involved when you have monocultures of just one type of invasive species taking over an area it's very it's it's very unstable i guess is what i'm saying so say you're not the tree hugger type or environmental type well why else should i care well these are big losses economically due to invasive species the forestry agriculture tourism fisheries industry some estimates as high as $120 billion a year in damage and pest control in the United States. That is not a small number. And the vast majority of these things are done well after a species is established. We are talking about over five times what Europe is dealing with, even more so than what all of Australia is dealing with. And if we can just get involved with early detection and reporting and um, do something about it before these species become established. So we need feet on the ground looking for things out, out in nature, right? Before they become problems. We can prevent all of these money, all this money and resources going into these preventative things long after it's like, you know, you can really do a lot about it. So that's where you guys come in. That's where we need community members and volunteers, citizen science, community members stepping up to think about these global issues that I brought up, but act locally. It is not a wash. We don't, there, we, this is, it seems overwhelming, but there are things that we can do in our uh, locally to really make a big difference, right? So you may have seen this term citizen science or community science, but it was actually probably coined by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, so dealing with birds, but it really just involves community members, volunteers like you that are stepping up and working with experts and scientists to solve real world problems. And it means like some sort of data sharing between the feet on the ground, community members like yourselves and going out and noticing things and then just like reporting them to scientific agencies or people like me, like a citizen science coordinator. And this, it's a dialogue, a good citizen science, community science project involves a dialogue where it's not the experts telling telling all the community members what to do it's really about it's it's both ways where members are community members are informing the scientists and the scientists are informing the community members and that's where we break down the barriers and why your your involvement is so important in terms of our own programming you know we have a lot of our invasive strike force volunteers we are get trained like we're going to train on just a, a couple of different species today to go out and identify a few invasive species that are found in our region and then and then report on you know where we're finding them it gives us information on how invasive species are traveling areas and where we can make a difference and make uh, management decisions right um, and do some removal pro uh, projects that involve community members as well to protect the intact or nearly intact habitats we offer internships and like I said before, we have everyone working from like high school interns all the way up to people who are well into their retirement and just want to give back or, or earn master gardener credits. So there's lots of opportunities to get involved. And a lot of our volunteers have no plant knowledge at all prior to this, and they end up loving it and learning so much. Uh, now, most of the obstacles that I face as a coordinator and trying to get people involved is that I mean, I know when I first started at this job, my training is in aquatic sciences and fit. I was like a fish nerd and I had to learn plants almost from scratch. And I remember going out in the forest and being like, oh my God, look at this. It just looks all green. There's no, I'm never gonna figure out how do I ID plants. It's just too overwhelming. It's the sea of green. I don't have guidebooks with me. And even when I have a guidebook, you know, oftentimes I'm like, well, it doesn't look like what I'm looking at. It can be time consuming. So this is a lot of like uh, understandable like sort of, um, you know, wariness about getting involved in projects like this. And I will say that there are some amazing nature apps that have helped me get over the hurdles. And I'm saying volunteers of all ages have loved these things. I, the one I highly recommend is Seek by iNaturalist. It's described as like a, just a fun game to play, but essentially if you know how to use your cell phone to take a picture of your family members. That's all it requires. 
And the way that it works is you essentially hold up your phone to what you're looking at. And in real time, almost like a, you know, you go to the grocery store and they have a bar scanner, you hold it up to whatever you're looking at. It's as simple as holding it up to it. And it'll tell you in real time what you're looking at. It is literally that simple. You can choose to take a picture or not of it. And this has helped immensely with people who are really wary of like, I don't know, I don't feel confident, I don't know my IDs, to help you get over that hurdle until you know it yourself. And then you're like, wow, I've learned so much in such a short period of time. I wanted to show you guys just how this works in action. Um, if you are interested in this, because I'm not with you today to show you a lot of the IDs, but it's a huge time saver and it's so much fun to use. It is like, it's you'll learn so much by using it. So I wanted to play a short video for you and hopefully you can hear my audio to see it, just as to how Seek works and, um, and, and how, you know, how basically how it works for you. So this is a gentleman that's going out into a field and using the Seek app. Okay, so he's holding up his phone to this flower, right? And over here, you'll see that it's genus and it'll tell you like you basically want to get to species, but it's a type of vetch, right? So essentially some type of species that he's looking at. And then he hold it up close, and now he's identified this simply by holding up his phone, doing nothing more than that, that this is a blue blossom that he's looking at. It's amazing. A dwarf checker mallow. What's neat is that you can take a picture, and it'll tell you, is it a native species? Or is it introduced or invasive? It'll show you what its range map is. Like, where do you find the dwarf checker mellow in the world? All in real time. It's really incredible. It'll tell you a little bit about its taxonomy and what other plants it's related to. It's also great with kids. You can earn badges and play little games with it as well. They're, they put out monthly challenges with like, uh, oh, find this type of species or this color of flower or something. So super fun for the whole family. And as adults, I will say, I, I, I mean, my knowledge of what lives around me has skyrocketed. And it doesn't just ID plants, but it also works with anything that doesn't move too fast, right? So things like insects, uh, butterflies, moths, you just hold it up and you immediately, like things crawling around your house, like it's it's an incredible tool. So I want I want you to like, just have this in your back pocket as a tool and resource that's really, really fun and super, super easy to use. Okay, so back to the presentation. Sorry, I gotta move my around things here a little bit. Okay. So even if you don't wanna, if you're not an app person and you don't wanna use that, I will give you some confidence today going in. Like it's just, you have to think about identifying plants as just like identifying people in a crowd, right? I mean, if you look at a crowd like this, it's really no different than looking at a forest like this. You just have to know what to look for and how to break it down, right? So that's what I'm going to do a little bit towards the second half of this presentation today. Once you've developed what I call like a search image for what you're looking for, so like things like leaf shape or what, how the leaf looks on the outside of it or its growth pattern or something like that, you'll learn to identify it quickly and you'll get really excited because you're like, oh, I can do this now. And even if I'm not fully confident, I know I have the app in my back pocket to be like, oh, okay, that could actually confirm what I thought it was. And then you'll start smiling, being like, yeah, I got this. So that's what we're after. Okay. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit and think about some of the common invasive species that we're seeing in our region and start to boost your own confidence in some of the IDs and, and what we're seeing as both native and invasive in our region. I'll show you some field ID videos to help you out with some of the IDs. Probably the one very likely that you see all over the place, which is really devastating to forest ecosystems. And a lot of people have on their properties, unfortunately, including, including myself, um, you know, it was a very, very common hedge plant that was planted is Japanese barberry. 
it's uh, got kind of a wild look to it, especially in natural areas. So it's a deciduous, thorny shrub, arching branches that you start to see these red berries appear now and very spoon-shaped leaves to it, an oval-shaped berry. So the best way that I can show you what this looks like is by showing you a video that I took out in the field and you'll know how to identify it. And then we'll go over some of the key characteristics as a review later. So um, again, it might be a little, it'll sound a little tinny coming through because it's going through my speakers as I'm presenting remotely. And it might be a little jumpy, but you'll get the basic gist of it. You're looking for spoon shaped leaves and a certain type of thorn and berries on it. So I'm going to show you that right now branches that I had mentioned before. So again, if you can see this almost flat, very thin spoon shaped leaves that run along these branches and you can start to see that there are little flower buds that are starting. You guys know what I mean by like a little baby spoon? Doesn't it look like a little baby spoon? That's how I like typically think of it, like you're feeding a like an infant or you know toddler. to appear this video is being taken in mid-april but by may you'll start to see these almost whitish old these eventually turn into flowers in the spring so you don't have to worry about that now i'll show you what, to, what you should be seeing or uh yellowish flowers that start to come and they tend to come out by these little leaf clusters here um another thing that i wanted to point out is that usually by the uh end of the summertime you'll start to see these berries, these red berries appear, and these are actually lasting from last year. So these red berries are more oval in shape and um, tend to be more elongated than some of the other ones that we'll see uh, in terms of lookalikes. Red berries are usually a dead giveaway that you got an invasive species. Uh, just as a general rule of thumb. And you can see that the, the red berries are actually appearing now in the fall. So you'll start to see them. And if we can get a close look at what these thorns look like, you see how they go straight up and they almost look like toothpicks. And you can get an idea for scale of both of these things from, from my hand and, and fingernail next to it, right? But almost like these very, very thick, sharp ones that hit to, uh, sharp thorns that appear at the end of the leaf clusters. Spoon shaped leaves and thorns that look like little toothpicks. Okay, those are the key IDs to, to kind of separate it from some of the others we're going to talk so about So that just gives you a, a, a general look at that. The only other thing I wanted to point out is if you take a look at the base of this, zoom into the base of this, there are multiple um, stems that are arising on this, just this one plant. And again, you know, because it's so dense in the middle, you know, these harbor are lots of ticks. So I got to be careful to check myself afterwards and small mammals and rodents tend to use this as a uh, cover, which again, you know, provides hosts for some of these ticks. So these are some of the key features. And again, taking a look at, at the at the arching branches and that almost like wild look to it. Um, and we'll look take a look at some of the, the lookalikes in the area. But again, you're looking for the sharp thorns at the bait. So that's basically what Japanese Barberry looks like. And again, it's like tick central in these things. So if you have them on your property, um, that's, that's another thing to be mindful of and, and to think about, right? So Japanese Barberry, just to review um, and things to be on the lookout for. You've got these spoon shaped, baby shaped of the spoons, leaves and clusters of two or three along the stems. That's what the flowers will look like in the spring. But it's really these berries that you're keying in for right now that is dangling from them and that toothpick shape of its uh, thorn. In terms of management, okay, if you have barberry on your property, you want to do something about it, you can pull or dig them out. That's usually about 70 to 80 percent effective. Because of the thorns and stuff, you'll want to wear gloves. And anytime that you're removing these things, you want to like pile everything like if you're out in the middle of a trail and you can't really bag it you can pile it on rocks off the trail so that these things can dry especially if you've got berries that are in it you really don't want to leave them in a place where they can spread so oftentimes you want to bag these things and you want to cut the larger plants close to the ground you usually want to do this before the seeds develop so usually late fall before you see those berries is that's a great time to do it and if removal is the goal, you want multiple cuttings each summer and just kind of keep at it. Winter cutting, however, encourages new growth. So that's just one thing to be mindful of. I want to contrast that with our second common invasive species, which is multiflora rose. 
that is another type of shrub with that's very thorny, right? Whereas white flowers are known that you're going to see here that appear in the spring. And they can also form these really, really dense clusters of shrub and very, very thorny. I know when I'm in my backyard removing stuff, getting hammered by thorns and stuff, it's usually multiflora rose, barberry, something like that, or like raspberry bushes, right? So the question is, how do we distinguish that between that and Japanese barberry, which I showed you before. So again, I'm gonna show you another field video that is going to distinguish that from what we saw with barberry. So this is what it looks like. A spoon-shaped, almost spatula, very to species with sort of a wide. Okay. Japanese barberry look-alike alert. What we're looking at here is actually not Japanese barberry, but multiflora rose, which is another invasive species with sort of a wild growth pattern to it. So if you're out and about and you see this almost this wildness of growth in those arching branches, it may be multiflora rose. So there's a couple of different things you can look for. Let's take a look at the berries that have persisted over the winter into the early spring here. You'll see that they are red, very similar. So this video was taken in early spring, but you're also gonna see these red berries starting to appear very, very shortly. And as you can see, they persist all winter long. And I want you to watch and pay attention. How do these berries differ from that Japanese barberry? They're Japanese barberry, but they're not nearly as elongated and oval in shape. All right, so they're more, they're a little bit slightly rounded and they have like the black tips at the end, as you can see here. So that's one of the features that can, that can help distinguish it. Let's take a look at some other features about multiflora rose that are slightly different. If you take a look at the thorn, to me, that looks like the dorsal fin or so, or of a, uh, of a shark or something. So it's more recurved and, and kind of a curve towards the back. For you see the difference between the dorsal fin shape to the roses and you see how it's almost look like it's like pasted on like you see how it's a different color than the rest of the stem that's another key feature versus like the barberry remember it was more toothpick shaped it's a huge difference that's what i look like that's what i look for in the differences between them versus barberry which has a very straight almost toothpick shape to it and if you can see behind that thorn you see um that there is almost what are called these fringed stipules at the base. So if you can see, uh, if I can get my finger in there. See this little fringed, almost like uh, these fringed stipules or the base of the, of the leaf stalk? A stipule is basically a base of a leaf stalk. And you see how it almost looks like a caterpillar or something? I'll show you in a picture in a second. But that's what distinguishes multiflora rose from other, like a native rose, like a Virginia rose or Carolina rose. It's these little caterpillar-like looking things at the base of it. So just to go back to the actual pictures, it's, it's good to show you here. So this little caterpillar-like looking thing, I don't know what else to say. It looks, like a, it looks like a little bug or something at the base of that leaf stalk. That's the key between that and say some other, other roses. And really the difference between that and say barberry is just the shape, that dorsal fin shape to its thorns versus barberry has the toothpick shape. And of course, these beautiful white flowers that come out in springtime, right? And you can see that these almost look like, um, the berries look more like maracas, you know, like you're dancing with maracas versus like the barberry is more like elongated, okay? So that's some of the some of the differences. In terms of management, this is really hard to deal with. Unfortunately, multiflora rose, um, uh, you really need to remove all the roots from it. So you got to hand pull or dig small plants, removing the roots. And any fruits that you pull again need to be bagged. You want to cut to the roots and repeat as needed. Um, I've talked to people that um, after after you cut it down very low. This and Barberry have used like torches, like blow torches after a rain to kind of get at the get at the roots or very, very close to the soil. Um, pruning multiflora rose will only like really stimulate growth. So you really got to get down close to the roots to really get rid of it. And you want to do this usually before the seeds ripen again and usually in late fall. I haven't seen the berries and seeds ripe yet. So there's still time to deal with multiflora rose at this time of year. All right. Earlier in the talk, I had talked about this nasty vine. I'm sure you guys have all seen it. It's Oriental Bittersweet. And it is everywhere just covering our trees in our region. It's a, it's a horrible invasive species. It climbs and corkscrews up trees, like a python just like 
uh, gripping on like a boa constrictor. It, it, it's really, really bad. You can see that here and it ends up girdling the trees. Now the new vines, as I'll show you in the video too, they almost look like coiled snakes, like looking for perches to wrap around something. The only other thing that I'll point out is that I don't have in the video are these orange berries. Like if you go outside right now, I guarantee you're gonna see these orange-ish berries in and around trees and it's it's oriental bittersweet. Um, and you know, they, they come out now in the fall time. And uh, you know, maybe you're working in your garden and you see these almost like carrots um, orangish roots, that's bittersweet as well. So the best way I can show you again is just to show you a field ID, ID video. It's not allowing me to escape, hold on. Okay, uh, let's go back to our videos here and we'll get to Oriental Bittersweet. You're looking for that corkscrew fashion of vines going up a tree. Here's a good close-up look of the vines of Oriental Bittersweet. And the reason you can tell is it is actually a couple of different ways. You see how it's wrapping around this tree in a corkscrew fashion? So it's twisting and wrapping around almost like a python that's going up this. It's actually can even wrap around itself. You might even see these dark knobs with, again, a couple of different vines that are wrapping around it itself. Also, I will notice, you will notice that it has a lot of dots on it. Now, it depends on the age of that vine as to whether you'll see those. But those are lenticels and ways of uh, oxygen exchange uh, in inside and outside of the vine. And uh, that's another distinguishing feature of it. You got to look, it's, it's almost like dotted with those. Um, but again, that depends on the vine. You can see that all throughout here. But you're really looking for that corkscrew pattern. I did want to point out that right below it is poison ivy. And again, poison ivy with the three leaves. So there's poison ivy going just below it here. Okay. Couple of different ways to remember poison ivy. Leaves of three, let it be. The other thing, the other phrase to remember is it's like poison ivy tends to have really hairy tendrils on it. So don't be a dope and touch the hairy rope. That's how you know you're looking at poison ivy. Poison ivy also does not corkscrew around trees. Poison ivy tends to meander like a river up a tree. Oriental bittersweet will wrap around a tree. Here, but that's all that twistiness right there. That is classic of Oriental Bittersweet. We are filming this right now at the beginning of May, and you can just see, like, even, even the branches that are coming out of this twisting vine here, you can see that the leaves are starting to form. And again, so this is what the leaf structure will look like. You can see that there's little teeth at the edge of the leaf, so that's that's another class. When I talk about teeth, I almost, I'm talking about a serrated edge, like a serrated knife. So Oriental Bittersweet has serrated edges to it, okay? I also want to show you what a very young Bittersweet looks like, okay? But you can see how it kind of comes to a point with teeth on the end. But this is what young, what are called leaders look like. M here is a little, um, it's, it's like reddish brown. And you can see that the lenticels on you a younger version of okay. bittersweet and, and what it looks like. You can see that the that the bark um, on this stem here is a little um, it's it's like reddish brown and you can see that the lenticels on this are, are more white or those bumps that you're seeing for um, gas exchange are white. You can see the leaf clusters again and if you zoom in very closely you can see that they're two little tipped points on the leaves okay so when this starts growing out you'll see that the leaves are arranged alternately as well so they're not going to be opposite of one another um, as this begins to grow out. The other feature of the younger branches that I wanted to point out, we'll go over here, it's a little more obvious. So bittersweet, again, as a vine, is looking for something to wrap around, right, in that corkscrew fashion. So what you'll often see are these things that are called leaders. So you see how this is almost like, it's like a snake kind of perched up, like a cobra looking for something. Um, so I, it's sort of like the snake-like appearance. These leaders will come off of the main, you know, the uh, off of the main stem um, and be looking to wrap itself around something. You can see that this bittersweet here is wrapping around itself. So uh, almost this corkscrew twisting around itself. You can see how it's all tangled. So this is what the younger version of bittersweet will look like. And I, I just pulled it off. Okay, so that's essentially what you're looking for, like both mature and then younger bittersweet and how to tell it apart. Okay, 
So again, that corkscrew like fashion of it. The only other thing I wanted to point out to you is that as bittersweet gets more mature, the leaves will get bigger. You see how it's like when they're younger, it's almost like a pointed tip with the teeth on the end versus like older bittersweet might be a little bit more like um, rounded in shape, but still have the teeth on the end and just like a tangled mess. I mean, that's bittersweet for you. Okay, in terms of management, so you can pull up the young vines by the roots. Okay, remember that orange root at the bottom, but you wanna cut the larger vines low to the ground um, and you want multiple cuttings to really like kind of kill it. You wanna cut all the mature vines near to the base to prevent the fruiting. Typically the large vines you wanna cut in July and August before the um, uh, fruits mature and already we're, the fruits are mature at this point. Um, but you know, you like really what you want to get at is the younger bittersweets and then cutting down the mature vines, but try not to pull it off of the vegetation, like the, especially the really big ones, cause that can damage the tree, but you want to do most of these removals in July and August before the fruit comes out. Okay. Moving on to our last two, I'm sure you've seen on your properties, um, is garlic mustard. And the reason why it's called garlic mustard is it's a, first of all, it's a member of the mustard family, but when you pull it up and you actually crinkle the leaves together, it smells like garlic. So what's really interesting about garlic mustard is that it goes through two years of growth. The first year is very low to the ground and is the rosette phase. And then in its second year, it starts to bolt straight upright and actually look really different. The leaves start to be more triangular. You'll start to see it start to flowering, these white flowers. Um, in upright pods. So the best way I can show you this again is a field ID example of the different age classes. So this first year you can see it looks really, really different from the second year. So here's another field ID video for you to look at some of the variations you might see. But it was all actually about to wrap around this That's garlic, garlic mustard, mustard right there actually. as well. So those are some Hold of on. the features of the younger bittersweet. So more whites, lentisols, the bark is slightly different. Um, and uh, there we go. Okay. Of it, and this is going to be crawling along, creating start dense in a mats if you found that in a natural area along your trail section. Here is a whole field of garlic mustard. And you can tell it uh, again that remember that garlic mustard, as I said in the PowerPoint, is a biennial plant. And so it has two distinct years that look completely different from one another. So I'm filming this towards the end of May and you can see the second year of garlic mustard. It grows almost straight up in the air. Um, the leaves on it are actually pretty triangular and you can tell that is garlic mustard just by crunching it up in your hands, smelling it. Yep, smells like garlic. And you can see that the white flowers are pretty prevalent on it right now. What these are- Those white flowers will go away eventually. They don't last very long, um, but, and you are not gonna see that, that now. I'll show you what it looks like now, like this late in the season, but this is what it will look like in, in around uh, late spring. Here are, these are called saliques, um, this kind of like stalk-like appearance to it. And uh, they will, uh, they contain the seeds and they actually have ballistic propulsion and will shoot the seeds out. Um, eventually, once, um, very soon, this will actually die off and then it'll just sort of like leave behind the stalks of this. They'll turn sort of a brownish color and then you won't be able to recognize it towards the end of the summer, early fall. But right now is a great time to view and see garlic mustard. And you can see it's just totally taken over the uh, ground cover here. I also wanted to point out what his first year of growth looks like. This is the rosette stage. So in his first year of growth, it's much lower to the ground. Um, you know, this is a couple of inches off the ground here. Um, and this is like a huge rosette, but you can see that it's more like U-shaped or like almost like horseshoe shaped. The strong, that sort of sense of, um, smell of garlic is even stronger on this now if you crush this up but you're really looking for that like u-shaped to its first year of growth sometimes they'll be really big like this but you can see like right next to it some of the other rosettes are much much smaller so so like very very different structure from one year to the next uh but they, they you you can cook with garlic mustard like it's it's edible <laughs> so um so that's just one another thing to be thinking about okay 
Um, I did, you know what, I want to show you what the garlic mustard looks like at this time of year, just so you know how to ID it when it's all brown, but it essentially looks like this. Mustard looks like after it has lost its leaves. So this is actually a good look at the saliques and that's more like stalk-like the shape to it. And as it grows, this is what will hold the seeds and end up dispersing those seeds. But this is long after. You might see those husks, those brown, brownish, tannish husks uh, uh, on it now. That's what the second year of growth looks like. You'll still see the rosettes, though, that are green. That, that will persist all winter. Okay. On to our last one, guys. We're almost there. Oh, actually, in terms of garlic mustard, it's actually really easy to manage. Even though there's a lot of it, it's easily pulled by hands. And the best time to do that is before it goes to seed in June. And you want to bag and remove if in seed. But if you pull it every year to exhaust the seed bank, I mean, it does take persistence. But it comes right out of the ground and is very, very easy. Kids of all eight toddlers can pull it out of the ground. Like it's really easy and just good a good little family project to work on. Uh, just make sure not to uh, spread the seeds so you wanna bag up the seeds if there are any. And then our last one is another common one that you're gonna see. It's Japanese silk grass. It's a light green grass that's, that's distinguished by a shiny stripe down the leaf axis. So if you see something in the forest that is not in clumps, but just like spreads out like this. See how this is not really clumpy, like clumpy grass? It's most likely Japanese stilt grass. So I don't know if you noticed in the video, but right in that same field, there was Japanese stilt grass all over there. So I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna go back and show you this in a second as to what Japanese stilt grass looks like. Hold on, just something's in the way. My, there we go. Give me a second here. Right in that same area is just full of still grass. Many people say like kidney shaped look to it. So just a couple of things to be on the lookout for for garlic mustard when you're out and about. In this same field of garlic mustard, you're also going, I don't know if you saw another invasive species here, but this is Japanese still grass and it's all over this area in which I'm out in, in the forest right here. Um, and again, right now, Japanese still grass is just starting to grow. It's got kind of a lime green appearance to it and actually won't have that distinctive silver stripe on it. But just to put my thumb down there for reference, uh, just to show you, but this is all still grass, lime green appearance. You can see that the main blade of grass you know, it's really easy to pull out. That's what the roots are going to look like. Um, and you can see that there's like the main blades are kind of coming off alternately on. Okay. So imagine this, you've got leaf there, leaf there, and they're kind of coming off alternate, like zigzagging up. What it looks like now is exactly like that, except straight up, like on stilts. It's just much, much bigger. And it's starting to turn brown now. But this is what young still grass looks like. And you see how easily I pulled that out? It's just like garlic mustard. It's going yoink right out of the right out of the ground. So really easy to remove. And that's just, and uh, eventually in midsummer is when you're gonna start to see um hold on. And that on the primary part of the um it start to see that silver distinctive silvery stripe that distinguishes it from some of the other grasses. So, and again, it's just like, it's that silver stripe that you're looking for in midsummer. I showed you in early spring what it looks like when it's lower to the ground, like really lime green. And then now it's just like straight up on stilts with like zigzagging, almost like a grim reaper scythe or something coming out of either side of it. Okay. Typically, still grass is really hard to remove, but um, we have amazing volunteers who have done these sorts of removals. It usually takes about five years of annual pulls. You can pull small patches of it before the seeds mature, usually in late August or early September. So, um, you know, maybe kind of getting too late for that now and just brushing shoes and equipment to prevent respreading. Again, I've heard people use the blowtorch method um, after, after a rain to use it. I've never done that personally, but that's just something else that I know has worked for, for some people in the past. Uh, it's notoriously difficult to get rid of though, but hand pulling before the seed set is, is, is good. Again, followed by like a blowtorching or, you know, even just um, uh, doing 
uh, like weed whacker and stuff at certain times of year um, in like late summer. And essentially you want to do it before it goes to seed. So allow it to grow, but right before it goes to seed is when you want to do, do the treatments. All right. So those were the five common species. We've talked about ways of getting involved, but if you did want to be, become involved in our programs and learn more about how to give back and not just be overwhelmed by invasives, but like, you know, I want to learn more. Like I, this is just five of many that you could help ID. We, we put out um, like basically like scavenger hunt style challenges every month where we put out a, oh, be on the lookout for this type of species. And it's called the EcoQuest Challenge. And we usually feature something in a particular month that's really obvious, like it's berries are coming out or it's flowering or something like that. And then you use the Seek and iNaturalist app to help record it. Like you're just out for a walk and you're like, oh, hey, that's what Brent was talking about. And he's on the lookout for, I'm going to take a picture of it. So um, we have lots of people involved with this and in our more rigorous survey uh, programs that are available. We have lots of master gardeners who know a lot about gardening and flowers, but not a lot about some of the native species that we see out in natural areas that they get community service hours, master gardener hours, and there's plenty of ways to get involved. I just wanted to show you our um, Invasive Strike Force EcoQuest page. So like this past month, you guys might have this on your property, Miscanthus or, Chi or Chinese Silvergrass. This is very, very common on people's properties, very common. Um, almost like a kush or like troll hair look to it. Um, with the seeds, uh, seed heads coming out of it. But that's our focus for the month of October because it's escaping cultivation. So you have it on your properties, maybe, and now it's getting into natural areas and starting to overtake our native species in meadows and things like that. So that happens to be our challenge for October. We're going to be doing a new one in November. But every month we put out a call for people who just want to go out and take pictures of like, the other one was, uh, you know, be beach leaf disease, and you learn about it. I usually post a video on how to ID it and stuff. So that's just one way to get involved, or you become involved in our survey programs, which will start up again in the spring. So I will leave you with this and then take some questions. But essentially, this is how I want you to think about it. There's plenty of things you can do for in terms of ID, but why get involved? Like you got to take the next step. And honestly, for me as a nature nerd, it's because I love asking questions and learning about what's around me. With these apps and these things at your disposal, it's just so much fun to get out there and learn about what you're seeing on your hike. It can really transform the hiking experience. I'm an athlete. I'm a runner. Usually, I just like to like go, go, go. And this having this job now has really allowed me to stop and, and, and appreciate what I'm seeing along the hike as well and learn about... The, the, uh, the native wildlife and diversity of plants that we have around us and how to protect us and ask questions about what I can do as a citizen and community member to get involved. So with that, I will take questions. Here's our email address if you guys have questions, but I'm, um, uh, and don't feel like asking on this call, but I'm, I'm happy to uh, do what I can to help you guys out. Thanks, Brent. This is terrific. Uh, we do have some questions from our chat. So let me start back from the very first one. Sure. Um, is there another way to access Seek other than using your phone, the, the iNaturalist? Yes. So, well, the answer to that is yes and no. You need a device to actually take a, yes, you can. The answer is yes. <laughs> You basically need to you basically need to be able to um, take a photo of whatever it is that you're looking at. You can do that with your own camera, but then you have to get the camera to download that that image onto your computer, and then you can put that you can put that image uh, that you took on your camera into iNaturalist online. Mm -hmm. okay. And then it can ID it for you um, by using the computer interface. So you have your picture. It'll ask you to like upload a picture and then it'll give you suggestions on as to what it is that it's seeing. Now, I, what I don't have time to talk, what I didn't have time to talk about, but I have like made lots of lessons on is like Seek is actually just an ID app. It's just like in real time, but it uses what's called the I, iNaturalist, which is a much more robust database 
um, for IDs and it's like a community members get and get and um, get together and they share things. And so iNaturalist is the really the photo database where all the seek pictures like kind of get, gets their ID and uh, photo recognitions from. So they work together. I don't have time to really go into that today, but Seek, what I find for beginners is the easiest to use because it, it shows you in real time. You don't even need to take a photo. It just mm -hmm. like hold your phone up to something. Um, now we're getting to the part of the season where we're starting to lose the leaves and things are crinkling and curling up. So Seek is not gonna work as well with some of the leaves at this point. But if you have obvious features, like it, it's wonderful, wonderful in the spring and summer because you have like the leaves are robust, you've got things are flowering, the berries are maybe out, and that's when it works really well. We're getting towards the end of the season in terms of its like usability, um, but it still will work for like uh, another couple of weeks if you wanna go practice it on, on things that are obvious. Great. Um, Diane wants to know, how does one effectively discard these invasives? So yeah, I kind of answered that towards the end, but uh, basically, like we have field crews that need to go out and work in remote areas. So if you don't have ready access to like garbage bag or you don't um, want to dispose of co constant waste and you know that brush pickup or whatever, the best way to do it is if you're out in a remote area or you don't have access to garbage bags to put into landfills, um, you want to find a nice open area where it's just pure sun exposure and you can dry everything out so that it can't survive. Like you can hang it uh, from things, like so you pull it out by the roots and you hang it to dry, or you put it on a big open rock. That's what we have to do in remote areas is just find an open area where it can't take root again. You know what I mean? Like, so that it can't take root again and re-sprout. So you want it to just completely get it dried out. So if you don't have access to, the garbage bags are foolproof because it'll go to a landfill, uh, and so if you're on your own property and you're, especially if you're seeing seeds or berries, you really have to dispose of that through, through those means, uh, through like garbage bags and then, and, and taking them out. But if, if you don't have that option, drying them out mm -hmm. in an open, open space where it can't have access to soil. Unfortunately, some of these really persistent invasive species can like even root fragments, they can, they can sprout up again. So you got to be very careful that it's fully dried. And that it can't like take root on 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 through soil again. So for mo for the most part, you're suggesting that if we have stuff at home that we're pulling up, we need to bag it and send it off with the disposal team. Are yeah, we, no, unless you can you can um, you can potentially mulch it up if you, if you know if you're doing it at a part of the season where it doesn't have the seeds yet, the seeds aren't mature. Yeah, that seems dangerous, right? If you're mul at putting it into mulch and then, yep. but you gotta, yeah. So yeah, you gotta time it right. Time, it's all about timing, right? Sure. So the, the best time to do it is to actually allow the plant to, to grow a little bit and to be like, okay, I'm gonna put all, I'm just gonna start putting my energy resources towards reproduction and then you get it before they're mature. Okay, all right. So uh, Rosemary asks, how do you get rid of tree of heaven? Uh, Ilanthus, yeah, Al Altisma, yeah, as well as jumping worms. Hmm. I do not have a good answer for jumping worms. No mm. one has been able to resolve this. So, um, if you don't know what that is, they are. You probably just think that they're they're native earthworm, or actually, let me let me back up entirely. So it was mind boggling to me when I first got into this field that the earthworms that we have in our area are not native. They're European. And they're actually brought over by settlers and are actually, they may be good, great for, they're great composters and they turn over the soil really well. But when they escape into native forest ecosystems, they are destructive to the soil. Like I'm talking about earthworms that you learned in, you know, in, in kindergarten as being wonderful, like for uh, soil and stuff. They're, they're, they're not in the forest. They're, they're, they're actually, not good and they're not native. Um, so to make matters worse, not only are, are what we think of as like our typical earthworm, our European earthworms, not great. These, the, the Asian jumping worms turn over the soil even more. And they are found on the, the first couple of like inch or so of the soil. So if you're out digging in your backyard and you see 
worms that are moving more like snakes and fast and are really in the first couple of centimeters of the soil is probably these, these jumping worms. And the problem with them and other worms is that they, they're so good at their job of turning it over um, that it ends up stripping the soil of nutrients. The trees can't take it up fast enough. So it ends up like stripping it down. And then when it rains, it just washes out all the nutrients. So the, the plants, the native plants can't take it up in our forest and it's not good. It, you ever been in the forest and um, on, on the soft sort of like duff layer, it's called like spongy. That's what you want in a forest. But worms destroy that because they're they're so good at turning over the soil like turning over things and eating so fast that it, it destroys that layer that you need in good forest ecosystems so i don't have a good answer for that right now we're just in early detection phase um you know there's there's not much we can do in terms of control of jumping worms at this point whether there's going to be biological control or some sort of pathogen i i don't know um and now, in terms of Tree of Heaven, uh, that is another common invasive species I didn't have the opportunity to talk about today, but it looks like a sumac. Uh, they grow, they call Tree of Heaven because they grow straight up towards heaven, and they're very unstable. Like, they grow very high, and they can grow on cracks and sidewalks and everything, too. Um, and they are a host, their primary host species for an invasive insect that uh, we are really, really concerned about called Spotted Lanternfly which is coming up from Pennsylvania and going to start impacting things. Uh, so in terms of tree of heaven, you'll know that you have it on your property is if you ever tried to chop something down and it just smells really weird, like burnt rubber smell or something to it. Um, the, the best thing you can do with that is that it's really good at re-sprouting. So if you start to cut it down, without staying on top of getting out the re-sprouts, it actually sends a stress signal to sh to, for more shoots to come up. And so what you wanna do is you wanna cut it down very, very close to the base, get as much of it out as you can, and then stay on top of just yanking out the re-sprouts that are coming out. Cause those are easy, actually very easy to yank out and get rid of. So if you stay on top of it, you'll decrease its energy preserve, uh, reserves and get at it. So cut it very, very low to the ground and then stay on top of retreating that area and you'll eventually get rid of it. Hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, there's a couple things about the worms. Uh, Cornell Cooperative folks um, said that they're, they're very much discouraging any kind of plant swaps. That used to be a popular thing is people would, you know, or a garden community would have a plant swap. And they're really, really strongly discouraging that because of the easy transfer of jumping worms. Um, so just an FYI, uh, we were thinking about doing a plant swap as part of this big read and um, Joyce out at Cornell said, yeah. no, not a good idea. Um, so Tracy asked the question about uh, repeating this meeting. Um, we, will, we, we are recording this. And so the recording will be available on the Poughkeepsie Public Library District um, website um, on the YouTube channel. But actually, I will, I will send the recording to everybody, the link to everybody who's registered for, the, for this program. So you'll have a chance to see it from the beginning. I know, I know because of this crazy day, some people um, couldn't join us until late. Um, Diane says, our garbage company won't take yard droppings. You don't tell them it's in there. Ah, oh, you don't tell them. That's what, oh, uh-oh, yeah, okay. I've been sitting in the evening <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, question from Gully, uh, or no, from Mary. From Mary, is Virginia creeper an invasive? Great question. It is not. It is. Uh, it's native, um, and doesn't really tend to. It, it. I. I don't even know if in most areas it would even. So there. How do I say this? So there are. It's. It's a native species, and then you have some. Then you have some natives that are what are called nuisance species. Like people don't like poison ivy, it's native, but it's a nuisance, right? They want people want to get rid of it. Um, Virginia creeper, uh, like people sometimes leave it uh, and sometimes get rid of it. 
but it is a native species and I can't promote getting rid of native species as given my current job, mm -hmm. but it is a native species. And the one way you can tell the difference. So Virginia creeper has like five leaves coming off of it. Right. Mm -hmm. It's usually not, I mean, to some people, anyone can be allergic to anything. It's usually doesn't cause like rashes, but on some people it will. But, and then the other thing is that it, it just like, um, just like uh, poison ivy is that it will meander up a tree and not corkscrew like bittersweet. So usually on, on our trees here, you're going to see bittersweet, poison ivy, or Virginia creeper. And those are the three things that are going to be growing up a tree. Uh, but Virginia creeper is native, so is poison ivy. Okay. And, um, oh gosh, I just forgot what I was going to ask you now. It, uh, anybody in the room have a question for Brent? Gully says, thank you so much. Wonderful program. Uh, did I ask all the questions that we talked about? I think um, so, looking at the chat. Yeah, okay. Very nice. Um, I was curious about um, your, your citizen science programs. Do you, that's all done through email? You have, you create a list or something like that, that um, we get notified if you're, if you got your monthly challenge that comes by email? That's a great question. So there's, there's a number of different, I like, just because of, of the, how short the talk is and stuff, I couldn't get into everything, but essentially, mm -hmm. like, if you have questions, just email me at this, what's on your screen now. Okay. But um, there are, so there's the EcoQuest challenge is probably the least investment of time simply because you can just like go out and do it whenever. And there's no like assignment or anything like that. You just, you get a notification over emails. So you're like, hey, Brent, I want to participate in the EcoQuest challenge. Put me on the, on the list so that I know what species I'm looking for in the month. And, you know, which is when you're out walking and you see it, you can just snap a photo and upload it directly. And then it's like, no strings attached, super easy. And then there's the there's the more like, I don't wanna say rigorous because it's uh, it doesn't take that much time, but you have to go through a certain training with me and that's for the Invasive Strike Force Survey Program. And you'll learn not just five, but 14 common invasive species. And then you get a typically like a one to two mile section of trail that you go out and survey for us. And you have the whole year to accomplish it. And it's, you, we usually choose locations that are like really convenient for you, like a park you like to visit or a section of trail that you're like, oh, I walk this all the time. Like, now I'm curious, like what's there? And then you just like report to us what you see while you're walking. And so that is a little bit more intense, like in terms of data, you go out with a field sheet and you go through a training with me. Um, but people love it because they're like, wow, I just like a whole new world has opened up. So you can like the, the first initial step, if you're like, oh, I'm not sure like how much I want to dip my te toes in, sign up for, you just contact me and you're like, yeah, I'm interested in the EcoQuest and like what you're on the lookout for next month. And I'll like upload some photos to iNaturalist. So. Cool. That sounds great. All right. Well, uh, folks there, thank you so much for joining us. We've got lots more Big Read programming. I do want to remind you that the, um, Hudson Valley Philharmonic is doing the Big Read uh, concert tonight at eight o'clock and that is totally free. It is online. Go to thebardevon.org and look at their upcoming shows and you can click in to hear that program tonight at eight. Tomorrow at 2.30, we have uh, Dr. Meg Ronsheim of uh, Vassar College who's gonna be joining us um, via Zoom. And so if you want that link, uh, you'll have to register for the program and I'll send you the link. And she's going to be talking about restoring local landscapes. And I'm sure she's going to be talking about using native species. So it all ties together with what we've uh, been learning from Brent today. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate it, Brent. Okay. Have a good one, guys. Good all right. Thanks so much.